Uh, my name is George Naylor. I'm a farmer from Sherdan, Iowa. I started farming in uh, 1976, and I saw the price of my corn drop from a dollar, from two dollars and seventy cents when I planted my first seed down to a dollar seventy-four the next summer. Uh, needless to say, I've been active in farm descent in the Jimmy Truman, I mean, excuse me, Jimmy Carter era. Um, I think most people will recognize that farmers have been recruited into the Cold War under Jimmy Carter as they have been under, Jim, under Mr. Truman. Today we have four panelists who will give us their studied opinion of, the, of that era. First, I would like to introduce James L. Forsyth. He's professor of history and chairman of the history department at Fort Hay State University in Kansas. He is past president of the Western Social Science Association and a member of the executive committee of the Kansas Committee for Humanities. He's also a member of the Kansas State Historical Society. Mr. Forsyth is authoring a book on Clifford Hope, the Republican representative from Kansas who was influential in farm legislation and particularly the 1948 Farm Act. Mr. Forsyth did his undergraduate work at North Texas State University and received his PhD from the University of Northern Mexico, uh, excuse me, University of New Mexico. He is also interested in the ethnic groups in frontier agriculture. Mr. James L. Forsyth. The Truman administration was characterized, at least in its agricultural policy, by constant criticism and protest, and by several agricultural strikes. The importance as far as the farmer protest was concerned was a number of policy decisions that related to the New Deal agencies that were conceived during the Great Depression. There were several agents, excuse me, there were several changes in existing agencies in the Department of Agriculture early in the administration of President Harry Truman, and these changes and the resulting reorganizations caused intense concern among many farmers and farm organizations and outright protest from some. The reorganization of the Bureau of Agricultural Economics, which has been discussed here a little earlier, caused great concern in December 1945. The BAE had been under attack earlier in part because it had used monies for economic investigations, but primarily because Southern congressmen had opposed BAE's investigation of economic conditions of black farmers in the South. Rural congressmen also believed that BAE had been instrumental in developing a let prices fall policy in the United States Department of Agriculture especially letting cotton prices fall. Last, many blamed BAE for the policy of letting domestic prices fall to world price levels and then paying the difference between world prices and the parity price. The reorganization in 1945 meant that the broad planning aspects of the New Deal were ending. The work of Howard Tawley in trying to aid the disinherited in rural America and in trying to change the restrictionist production policies were gone. The work of BAE was transferred to several USDA branches, and the organization became a statistical gathering agency. The work of this rural action agency was at an end. James Patton of the Farmers Union was greatly upset in 1945 because, as he saw it, BAE had been the world's foremost social research agency. Two months later, Edward O'Neill of the Farm Bureau urged that the con a Congressional Appropriations Subcommittee prohibit quote, the BAE from conducting social surveys, agricultural planning and promotion, and opinion polls. The best summary of what the end of the, of the major activities, or at least the transfer of the activities meant, was best summarized by Professor Richard Kirkendall. He has written that when, the Truman, when Truman defended Secretary of Agriculture Anderson over the issue of BAE reorganization in December 1945, Truman's actions indicated that the story of the BAE as central planner and bold researcher had reached the end. The social research and rural poverty concerns manifested in BAE were also reflected in another agency which changed in the early Truman administration, the Farm Security Administration, which we've also heard about 
uh, earlier. The end of the Farm Security Administration and the creation of the Farmers Home Administration to handle farm credit was a direct blow at the earlier efforts of the New Deal to combat rural poverty. The Farm Security Administration became a social action agency following its creation in 1937 and was under constant attack in Congress throughout World War II, primarily by the Farm Bureau. The FSA during the economy-minded days of early 1946 was a natural enemy for those congressmen who were opposed to various forms of social aid and, re and relief for rural Americans. Near the end of World War II, Representative Herod, Howard Cooley, Democrat of North Carolina, introduced legislation to abolish FSA, to expand the Farmers Home Administration, and to transfer all agricultural credit agencies to FHA. Cooley's bill would terminate the resettlement and social action programs of S FSA. He believed that the Farmers Home Corporation should operate as provided for in the Bankhead Jones Farm Tenant Act 1937. One of his hopes was to end the paternalistic supervision and coddling practiced by the Farm Security, Admi Farm Security Administration in the past. And what he meant by paternalistic supervision and coddling was that blacks would now have to work at, minimum, at low wages on the southern cotton plantations, that the help to migrant workers in California would no longer be available, and they'd be at the mercy of the uh, farmers, the large uh, farm owners in California. And last, he meant that the people of North and South Dakota would be at the mercy, uh, would now be at the mercy of the grain people in Minneapolis, St. Paul. That, that work of SF, FSA in those three areas was called paternalistic supervision and coddling. There was opposition in Congress to Cooley's efforts. Congressman Clifford Holt, Republican of Kansas, opposed loan limitations and the changes that were called for by Cooley. Though Hope's views were expressed in 1946, they are still relevant today, I believe. He argued that it cost much more to enter farming in some areas than in other areas. So loan limitations prevented those young men who wanted to enter farming to achieve their goals. Hope stated, wheat farming in Kansas was one of those areas of agriculture that was a high cost entry area, perhaps a quarter of a million dollars or more just to get started today. Secretary of Agriculture Clinton Anderson was also opposed to the changes envisioned by Cooley and other congressmen, but he could not prevail. Instead, people like Farm Bureau President Eugene O'Neill had their way, and I might point out that Farm Bureau had its way throughout the Truman period. O'Neill was not opposed to the coordination of credit policies with other agricultural policies, but he was opposed, as he wrote to Democratic Congressman John Flanagan of Virginia, to use credit as an instrument to bring about the socialization of agriculture or other extraneous social objectives. The farm credit legislation that finally passed in 1946 was a compromise. It was acceptable to James Patton of the Farmers Union because the farm tenant purchase provision was in the final bill. Many less privileged rural American farmers were thankful for the aid of Flanagan, Cliff Hope, and others. But the Farm Security Administration, a social action agency in agriculture, was gone. Sidney Baldwin, in his study, Poverty and Politics, notes that the Rural Rehabilitation Program was liquidated. The Tenant Purchase Program, now called Farm Ownership Program, was transferred to the new agency. The New Deal action phase of the FSA was also now ended. But the Tenant Purchase Program was at least finally written into law. And when one evaluates the changes in BAE and FSA, it is easy to see that experimental programs were gone, uh, though FHA would aid farm tenant purchases and offer some rehabilitation. But Grant McConnell, in The Decline of a Grand Democracy, viewed the new program under FHA as primarily a device to aid veterans. Matter of fact, if you read the changes in the law, it said veterans had first chance. In other words, uh, they would receive preference over the rural uh, poor and others. Perhaps more important, as Sidney Baldwin notes, the FHA developed cordial relations with Congress through the remainder of the, president, uh, the Truman presidency and during the administration of President Dwight D. Eisenhower, the government's assault on chronic rural poverty in America that was begun during the New Deal waned until there was virtually no aid to America's rural poor. Then in 1961 and after, a part of the so-called war on poverty under President John F. Kennedy and President Lyndon B. Johnson, the government literally flooded the rural economy with credit. Meanwhile, of course, for 15 years, America's rural suffered. I have to skip over some time. <clears throat> the Congress passed in the waning days of the 80th Congress a Community Credit Corporation charter uh, that contained a prohibition that stood to, hate, uh, to hurt grain farmers. And most people seem to forget this piece of legislation in 1948. I think it's important. 
The Republican Congress provided a disturbing gift to American farmers called the Commodity Credit Corporation Charter because the corporation under the law could not acquire land, could not acquire or lease any storage facilities or build storage uh, bins on or near farms. Farmers then would not have the help that was so vital if crops were to be stored under government loans. So they said, yes, we're going to pay you to store the crops, but you can't have any place to store them. Okay. President Harry Truman criticized the Republican-controlled Congress and said that the provisions to prohibit commodity credit corporation storage facilities added grain dealers, or uh, aided grain dealers, like in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and elsewhere, and hurt farmers as the grain had to be shipped back and forth to uh, their farms or to foreign uh, commercial uh, markets and facilities. In other words, when the bin-busting crops of 48 came in, the farmers were standing around with no place uh, to store their commodities. They had to ship them uh, to Minneapolis and elsewhere. So when the commercial facilities were filled, no other place to store the, the grain then, the slap at the American grain farmers by the Repo Republican controlled Congress took on a new meaning because farm prices now fell. Grain prices fell below the 90% of parity uh, level for the first time since at the beginning of World War II. This issue over storage facilities loomed important at election time in 1948 when the grain farmers were reminded by President Truman of their treatment by the 80th Congress. Earlier in July 1948, a month before the price break, a Des Moines Register poll showed that Truman had 29% of the vote and Republican challenger uh, Governor Thomas Dewey had 56%. A few short months later, Truman had overcome the opposition and in November he swept Iowa. The Agricultural Act of 1948 uh, which is mentioned in the previous session, was the major legislation in the Truman years that was designed to affect all of America's farmers on a long-range basis. The Stegall Amendment, which had kept farm price supports high uh, during World War II and which was to expire on December 31st in 1948, uh, uh, required that a new law be passed and the USDA wanted a new law that would meet the changing agricultural situation uh, and did not want to go back to the uh, price support system of the 1938 legislation. Congress acted by holding a series uh, of hearings on long-range planning in 1947, and Charles F. Brannan and the Program and Policy Committee helped formulate long-range policy within the department. Many views, both from the Department of Farm Groups and others, were expressed in 1947. The Department of Agriculture wanted to ensure adequate supplies of meat and dairy products for the consumer. The department also wanted to ensure sustained agricultural abundance, and it was consideration for subsidizing the production of commodities through expanded school lunch programs, industrial feeding, and food allotments to low-income groups. The department also made its views known on existing policy during the hearings. There would be changes in the old New Deal programs, but price supports, production controls, and parity would continue. <clears throat> USDA wanted to modernize the parity concept in the new legislation. The recent changes in markets and increased purchasing power necessitated what they considered to be a new parity formula. The Department of Agriculture believed that mandatory price supports should be on non-perishable, storable commodities. Price supports for perishables then would be at the discretion of the department. The price supports would be below recent prices so that the free market could operate. Production controls would be used to shift crop production patterns to meet the new post-war market conditions. The USDA wanted to use production controls to eliminate chronic surpluses in certain crops, uh, such as potatoes, which Senator Muskie is very concerned about, I see now, uh, and to encourage the production of crops estimated to be in short supply. Several points were brought forth during the congressional hearings that would force modification of the USDA's proposal. Southern congressmen wanted high price supports for their cotton because cotton was, is marketed direct. They wanted 90% of parity. Not one, uh, excuse me, they wanted not 90%, they called for 100% of parity. Midwestern corn producers, who market much of their corn through the hog market, preferred flexible or, or sliding supports and more of a free market approach. Wheat producers on the plains, who also market directly, wanted high price supports, but they were opposed to their southern brethren. They only wanted 90%, not 100%. Farm groups disagreed over the level of price supports and the need for production controls, and the Farm Bureau uh, finally, in its many years of history, did split over what position it should take. In December of 1947, the Farm Bureau decided for flexible price supports, thus moving away from its early support of the New Deal programs. 
The Farmers Union, with large membership in wheat growing states, came out for rigid high supports at 90% of parity. James Patton of the Farmers Union even joined Secretary of Agriculture Anderson in calling for abundant production. That is, he opposed any production controls and wanted 90% of parity on all production. The Senate supported a modernized, flexible price support system uh, when the debate on the legislation began, thus reflecting the influence of the Midwestern views of the Farm Bureau leadership. The Senate determined the basic commodities to be cotton, corn, wheat, uh, tobacco, peanuts, rice, and wool. A sliding support began at 60% of parity if the estimated supply was at 130% of normal and moved upward to 90% of parity if the normal supply dropped to only 70%. And that would be what was estimated by the Department of Agriculture. There were uh, no provisions for production controls in the sliding or flexible uh, parity formula. It was believed that the parity scale itself would control production. The Department of Agriculture and Secretary Anderson, while supporting the flexible parity concept, wanted some form of consumer subsidies to expand consumption and some form of production controls, especially for perishables. And Anderson urged a flexible scale of 60 to 90 percent on basics and a zero to 90 percent scale on non-basics. The Senate followed the lead of Republican Senator George Aiken of Vermont, and Anderson got most of what he wanted, thus USDA and Farm Bureau uh, proposal. <clears throat> the story was different in the House of Representatives. Congressman Clifford Hope of Kansas introduced legislation to extend price supports on basic commodities for 18 months at 90 percent of parity with the Stego commodities, which were the perishables, protected at 60 to 90 percent. Hope's bill for 90 percent of parity on basic commodities passed on voice vote. Congressman Hope, then, was not ready to retreat from the guaranteed farm prosperity that was inherent in the Stego Amendment during World War II, and the House of Representatives shared that view to maintain farm prosperity. Politics, however, now entered the deliberations. The Truman Administration and the USDA supported Aiken's flexible parity bill and the Southern and Western Democrats opposed the administration and supported uh, Hope's bill of 90 percent of parity. Most Republicans uh, in the Senate supported Aiken's bill, in other words, flexible supports, because, as they said, it would be a whole lot less expensive to the taxpayer. But the Republican congressmen from rural areas supported Hope's rigid parity bill. The amended legislation was sent to conference committee, and after quite a bit of maneuvering and all, which we won't go into, uh, the legislation came out with Hope's 90 percent of parity bill uh, intact to extend for one year of the legislation, and then after that would go into a flexible uh, provision. Now, since <clears throat> no one seemed to like this Agricultural Act of 1948, and since the Secretary of Agriculture had now been elected to the Senate from New Mexico, Congress immediately set out to consider another farm bill in 1949. Uh, Anderson as senator, now wanted flexible supports as he had in 47 and 48, but he soon ran into difficulty in the Senate because the Senate Agriculture and Forestry Committee was split between rigid and flexible price supports, and in the House, the Agricultural Committee wanted nothing but high uh, price supports. In April 1949, Secretary of Agriculture Charles F. Brannan presented the Department of Agriculture's plan, what has become known as the Br uh, Brannan Plan. The plan built on Farmer Secretary Anderson's proposal for sustained agricultural abundance, but it contained new features as well. An income support standard, an expansion of the list of basic commodities, limitations on support received so that the, the family-sized farm would be protected. Now, both the House and Senate uh, Ag Committees indicated support for 90 percent of parity. There was a lot of politicking that went on, uh, and ultimately we find that the Brandon Plan did not receive much support. Uh, instead, they passed the Gore-Anderson bill, named after Senator Anderson and Congressman Gore of Tennessee. Uh, and in the act in 1949, they would continue then in 1950 at 90 percent of parity, 51 would go to 80 percent of parity, and then a flexible provision in 52. The Brannan plan did not have a chance in 49, primarily because farm prices were declining and non-perishables were accumulating at a rapid rate. Brannan had problems because farmers did not understand the proposal or care for its new concepts. Brandon wanted to make farm income, uh, not farm prices, the new standards, thus moving away from the parity concept. The system would have increased prices for meat and dairy products and thus would have been a type of production control as wheat and corn acreages should have been, would have been shifted to feed grains. The family farm would have been protected, or at least, Brandon argued, as supports would have been only on certain quantities, 
but this part of the plan broke down during question in Congress. Most critics seem to agree that production controls would have crept in at various times. Since 1950, the Brannan plan seems to have attracted more attention from scholars than from most farm groups. Perhaps I should note, however, that the income support standard tended to be a camouflage 100% of parity support on some crops, and I'd point out that some farm groups recently have now been advocating 100% of parity, which really ISS was. The last major activity, and my time is, is running out, uh, was the Defense Production Act in 1950 uh, during the Korean War. I might point out that Truman did not want a wage and price bill, which the Defense Production Act was. He did not want it for the same reason that Jimmy Carter said he does not want a wage and price uh, bill. Uh, <clears throat> many people in the Truman administration in 1950 during the Korean War in 51 said that they believed that a higher tax would drain off excessive buying power because inflation was a, an important problem. They wanted uh, higher taxes. They wanted other indirect controls such as restricting credit. It sounds like 1980. I'm sorry, folks, it was 1950. Uh, and in fact, we find a lot of similarities, perhaps. Uh, <clears throat> the Defense Production Act uh, did go into effect. Finally, there were controls placed on some agricultural products such as cotton and beef to control uh, the prices, but in order to hurry up my time, I would point out that the way the farmer broke, at least the cattleman broke, the provision of the Defense Production Act in 1950 was with the slaughter quotas in effect and then taken off with price controls that really put in, the farmer simply marketed his cattle. And the, cattle by, uh, the cattleman also marketed his cattle, and the market uh, decline went down to the normal level and really broke the back of the uh, federal legislation. Well, how would we evaluate the nearly eight years of the Truman presidency? Alan Mattisow, a critic of some of Truman's agricultural policies, notes that the eight years were the most eventful and prosperous years in the history of American agriculture. Never had the productive genius of the American farmer been better rewarded, Mattisow wrote, nor made a more valuable instrument of the national policy. And it was a great period. American farmers, many of them World War II veterans, driving their little Ford tractors or popping Johnnies, and the little red international harvesters uh, were making a living. They fed the world in the last days of World War II and nearly three years thereafter. They produced the foods and fibers needed for the Korean War. They sacrificed their prices uh, during the famine period so that the world could be fed at low prices. All they asked for was a fair deal. But in the fall of 1952, they again went to the polls, and this time they elected Dwight D. Eisenhower, and what they got was Ezra Taft Benson. Thank you. The life of the next panelist, Fred Stover, deserves a history symposium all of its own. There is no way I can do justice to this man. Fred has been active in, in farm organizations and concerned about all farm legislation and co-ops all, during all of his adult life. As a young farmer, he was very involved in local activities and was even president of his county farm bureau. When the New Deal programs came onto the scene, Fred Stover was instrumental in making sure that they served the cause of justice in the marketplace that farmers had demanded and so deserved. With the election of FDR, he became actively involved in developing farm legislation, breaking new ground. In December 33, he was appointed to the job of organizing and administering the 1934-35 corn hog program. I'd like to quote something Fred wrote to me about this. He says, I think I enjoyed that work the best. The way, the way the farmers turned out to meetings, the response was so heartwarming, it seemed like a rebirth of democracy in every township in the land. He traveled the nation as a field man for the AAA and was called to Washington in 1939 when the, thir when the third huge corn crop in a row threatened to ruin the guarantees of fair prices to farmers. He provided procedures and administrative expertise, and most importantly, the moral leadership to make the ever normal granary work for farmers and consumers. When things were going well in Washington, he came back to Iowa to organize a progressive farm organization and became the president of the Iowa Farmers Union. Fred and the organization made great headway in organizing farmers and spreading the, progressing, the progressive point of view. The powers that be naturally lowered the boom on Fred Stover and the Iowa Farmers Union, 
in that Truman era. But Fred has so much to be proud of. He's probably the only farm leader to speak at peace rallies from the 1950s up to the end of the Vietnam War. He made the nominating speech for Henry Wallace in 1948 at the Progressive Party Convention in Philadelphia. Today, Fred is the president of the U.S. Farmers Association and editor of the U.S. Farm News, the farm organization and publication with great integrity. I would now like to introduce the greatest American farm leader, Mr. Fred Stover. to establish my credentials. I thought before that the only credential I had was age. Thank you. Speaking at the banquet Monday evening, Dr. Fite raised the question of his credentials. And a uh, very important question. I was sure of my credentials as far as age was concerned. And by the way, speaking of that banquet, I learned that 96-year-old Scott Neering and I were born on the same day. Not necessarily in the same year, but on August 6th. Well, <clears throat> you know, I would have felt more comfortable on the panel for New Deal farm programs. That's really my bag. Dissent in the Truman era? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have a problem. <clears throat> the problem is that if I really spoke out the way I really feel about that pompous Pendergast protege, using my best barnyard language, I'd create a lot of sympathy for him. And I have no intention of creating sympathy for Hiroshima Harry. I'm, I should mention, passing, that I don't need to tell this audience that Scott Neering and I have a few other things in common besides being born on Hiroshima Day. Well. <coughs> There certainly was dissent in the Truman era, a great lot of it. As soon as it became clear that he was reversing FDR's policies, both foreign and domestic, on the reversal of foreign policies, that has been very well documented many, many times in the columns of your, our U.S. Farm News by General Hugh Hester, who I believe is the best informed man I know on foreign policy. But on the question of our long and shameful involvement in Southeast Asia specifically, well, Farm dissent, yes, a lot of it. But that suddenly disappeared when he cracked the whip with the police action in Korea and demanded conformity. I know so well how the Truman administration cracked the whip over some farm leaders demanding conformity. He got conformity and open and vocal dissent practically disappeared. We did not conform. <coughs> 
But I repeat, the tactic of cracking the whip and demagogically appealing for patriotism from the population, that did work in 1950. And I'm sorry to say it still works. In an article in the February issue of Newsweek, that good Pulitzer Prize winning writer Robert Lash wrote an article in which he compared Truman to a little fighting rooster. I thought that was very unfair. To the rooster, I mean. I, I find all too many comparisons between the present occupant of the White House and Harry Truman. And it isn't only the comparison with Truman. I find that the comparison with another occupant of the White House, that great engineer, Carter, you know, say claims he too is an engineer. The comparison is ominous. Well, I better get back to dissent on farm policies. Harry Truman harvested a lot of votes in 1948 by what has been called the pitchfork speech, Truman's pitchfork speech in Dexter, Iowa. As I recall, that pitchfork was never very well defined. I do recall that Harold Stassen and some other Republicans had been making some great speeches denouncing some appropriation for the Commodity Credit Corporation. But the fact of the matter is, farmers did have a pitchfork put in their back in 1948. But it was a bipartisan fork. The 60% of parity sliding scale Hope Aiken bill. It was passed by a Republican Congress, yes. But it was boondoggled through by a Democratic Secretary of Agriculture, Clinton Anderson, one of the primary architects of the bill, signed by none other than Truman himself. And upon signing it, he made the comment that he would like to have seen a little more flexibility in it. Unfortunately, that pitchfork speech was never answered. It should have been. We got busy. and got that 1948 Hope Aiken bill amended so that the 90% of parity price supports continued for a number more years. Well, I think it ought to be pointed out that the Truman era wasn't just from 1945 or 46 to 53. We are still in it with respect to both foreign and domestic policies. I'm sorry to say. 
in some ways perhaps the present engineer in the White House is more efficient or the system is than the great engineer Herbert Hoover was. At least they're doing a more efficient job of manipulating booms and busts and farm prices. In order to get farm prices down to 60% of parity, Hoover had to throw the whole economy into a perilous tailspin. But the present occupant of the White House and his aides can do it with the greatest of ease. At the same time, industrial prices, and prices of the transnational corporations are zooming into the stratosphere. Well, we have a boom and bust economy. A few years ago, I presented testimony to the Senate Agriculture Committee, and I gave them some charts on corn prices, soybean prices, and hog prices, taken from USDA records. Prices, our prices, go up and down like a yo-yo. Soybean prices going from $5 to twelve dollars and back down. Hog prices going from below thirty dollars to sixty dollars and then back to thirty dollars. That kind of a boom and bust economy. The trouble is now that boom and bust economy for farmers the Busts are getting longer and more severe. The booms are getting shorter and more and more far between. The last time the parity ratio got up to 102 percent, the only time the parity ratio got to parity was in August of 1973, and then it went down again just like a plummet. Well, this is corn hog country, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if you've been watching the markets in the last few days, but the price of corn and hogs and soybeans are below 50% of parity. And last January, the White House sent a drove of speakers and campaigners into Iowa and some of them told us, some of them told voters in Iowa that we had a booming farm economy. Correct quote. I'm sorry to say, some Iowans must have believed it. Well now, it is bad enough to have a boom and bust economy but ladies and gentlemen, when the leaders of our nation can't tell the difference between the two, that is a national tragedy. <laughs> well, some people probably think it's supposed to be that way. I think it is imperative 
that we change policies where a diminishing number of farmers are subsidizing a rapidly growing population with cheap food, food below the cost of production. I think it is high time we put an end to mining our soils, yes, and poisoning them, plowing from fence to fence, planting soil depleting crops, and sending those crops abroad at less than the cost of production, much less than the cost of production. That is the height of national folly. It ought to be stopped. It is high time, yea, well past high time, that a nation that is so rich or thinks it is so rich that it can squander billions of dollars abroad undergirding tottering dictatorships, such a nation ought to be making permanent arrangements to pay its long overdue domestic board bill to its food producers. <laughs> Perhaps because some people think it ought to be that way, uh, Farmers are supposed to accept it. <laughs> I want to read a short paragraph here. I have here a copy of U.S. Farm News for January 1968. The Johnson Freeman team, heading, subheading, holds the world record for robbing farmers. They don't hold the record anymore. <laughs> Jimmy and Berglin have the record now for robbing farmers. But I use this I use this because in a boxed item in the center of page, I quote a very well known professor. You know, professors haven't fared too well from what I've been listening to in some of these other panels. But I think it's time somebody was saying there are good professors, but that's not the one I'm quoting, going to quote now. <laughs> somebody said something about civilization and political science. Professor Kenneth E. Boulding. This is what he said. Quote, civilization is what happens in cities. Comma. There's an insult to the farm population just there. Civilization is what happens in cities. He doesn't say it doesn't happen in the countryside, but uh, well, civilization is what happens in cities. And the city is dependent on there being a surplus from the food producer and on some existing organization which can take it away from him, period. With this food surplus, the political organization feeds kings, priests, armies, architects, and builders, and the city comes into being. Political science in its earliest form is the knowledge of how to take the food surplus away from the food producer without giving him very much in return." End of quote. A both remarkable statement. Well, I think at this point we should tell Professor Boulding and a few other professors and a lot of so-called farm writers 
and prostitutes who prostitute the press to confuse people about farm programs and farm income, I think we ought to tell them. Remember, I said a while ago that permanent arrangements ought to be made to pay this domestic board bill. Here I want to put into the record the fact that permanent arrangements were made during the Roosevelt era. Arrangements were made to give farmers parity. Those arrangements, that program worked. It worked because those in power wanted it to work. It will work again. It must work again. This colossal ripoff of both farmers and consumers, yes, and taxpayers, has to be stopped. The people can stop it. I don't know if they will, but they can. To have a system, to have a program that works during the Roosevelt years, that gave farmers parity, gave consumers a bargain, cost the taxpayers almost nothing. To swap that for a program that gives farmers but half a parity and rip off, rips off the consumers. In the interview taped yesterday with Phil Allen, he asked the question, how can you get action to raise farm prices and the consumers outnumber us. I pointed out, I think others have pointed out before, there's practically no relationship anymore between farm prices and food prices. And today we have the highest grocery bills ever. At the same time, farm prices are at an all-time low. To make a swap like that, I tell you, that not only makes me sad, it makes me angry. When my good friend Don West finished with that poem of his yesterday, I wish I was a poet. You remember? Oh, there's grieving in the plum groves. I wish I could write a poem, something like that. Oh, there's grieving in the cornfields and the hoglots, and there's anger in the land. Poetry does help get across a point sometimes that you can't get across with mere prose. Quite a few years ago, someone sent me a poem that Denise said, author unknown. It is a good fighting poem. I thought of it when I watched that film the other night with those nonpartisan league organizers for a long time wondering whether they'd ever get anywhere and finally they did have success, I thought of that poem. Sometimes success is just around the corner and we don't know it. Well, with apologies to the unknown author, I'll try and give you that poem. That's been our battle slogan for a long time that kept us going. It's something like this. Success is failure turned inside out. The silver tint in the cloud of doubt. And you never know how close you are, for it may be near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worse that you mustn't quit, I think. Thank you.
Our next panelist, Merle Hansen, was unable to attend today due to a back ailment, but he has sent his presentation on tape. He's a 60-year-old farmer who farms with his son, John. I feel a bit like uh, following the Fourth of July parade or the fireworks exhibit uh, coming after uh, both Fred and Merle. But I'd like to uh, talk a few minutes uh, in a general way about farm descent in the Truman era. That uh, farm descent in this era is related uh, to a bigger uh, subject, that of the disruption of left of the left liberal component of the Roosevelt coalition that came in the post-World War II era. And when I talk about the left liberal uh, coalition, I'm talking about a variety of people, uh, Catholic trade unionists, uh, neo-populists, uh, civil rights activists, uh, communists, uh, subscribers to New Republic and Nation magazine. And it's a variety of people, which are a group of people who had hoped to continue the wartime unity of the big three in the post-war era to preserve uh, peace in the world, and also to continue the wartime unity uh, domestically so as to expand the uh, New Deal programs and New Deal ideas at home. But, but such hopes were unfounded as the Cold War developed, and left liberal circles were disrupted and torn apart by Cold War issues in the next few years. You're looking at the Truman administration, well, we find uh, Truman becoming president at a time when tensions were worsening between the United States and Britain on one hand and the Soviet Union on the other. And these tensions worsened during the, the Truman presidency, and his behavior uh, contributed to the polarization uh, between East and West. Uh, domestically, the first years of his administration uh, also were characterized by a considerable amount of bungling, and in some circles, a saying uh, ensued, to err is Truman. But perhaps the, the single greatest issue that uh, provoked uh, opposition within uh, left liberal circles uh, was in the realm of foreign policy. And that Truman was perceived as uh, breaking with the Roosevelt policy of uh, cooperating with the Russians. Uh, he was seen as endorsing uh, Winston Churchill's uh, Iron Curtain speech when he fired Henry Wallace as uh, Secretary of uh, Department of Commerce. Uh, this tended to uh, provoke quite a bit of uh, disillusionment or uh, capped off some disillusionment that was growing and convinced uh, some people or reinforced their conviction that he was unsuited to be uh, president of the United States. But by the fall of 1946, we find uh, quite a few people in the Democratic Party who felt uh, Truman must go. And when the Republicans won the congressional elections in November of that year, uh, that belief was reinforced. There were two options to those people who wished to uh, replace Truman, or people who wanted to replace him who were in the Democratic Party or close to it. Uh, one was to nominate somebody else as a Democratic candidate in 1948, and the other was to start a third party. Uh, ultimately, there will be a split in uh, left uh, liberal circles. Uh, one group uh, will opt to work for another Democratic candidate, and that was an unsuccessful uh, option, and the other uh, was to uh, opt for creating a new party. And in many people's minds, uh, in retrospect, that also was an unsuccessful option. But this left liberal component of the Roosevelt coalition, uh, much of it uh, alienated from Truman, uh, is not a monolithic group. Uh, but in the uh, late 40s, we're going to see Cold War issues uh, dividing left liberal circles, and the labor movement, the uh, fire movement and civil rights movements will be disrupted as a result. If we look at the CIO, uh, the National Farmers Union, the ACLU, the uh, Southern Conference on Human Welfare, uh, the American Veterans Committee, all of these organizations are ones in which uh, a domestic Cold War was conducted 
eventually uh, the anti-communist liberals prevailed or the organization uh, went under. Now, I think part of the explanation for the uh, conformity and the anti-reform sentiment of the 1950s, part of the explanation for that is this Cold War disruption of left uh, liberal forces in the late 1940s. Well, by the time of the 1948 presidential campaign, uh, left liberal circles are already uh, undergoing polarization. And we find uh, in the anti-communist liberal camp uh, headed up by the ADA, uh, trying to drum up a liberal support uh, for Truman's foreign policy, at the same time uh, trying to find a replacement for Truman to head the Democratic ticket. Uh, here in uh, Iowa, we find the CIO endorsing uh, Eisenhower as a uh, potential Democratic candidate uh, 1948. Uh, so we have the ADA on the one hand. On the other hand, we have an organization, uh, PCA, uh, Progressive Citizens of America, which was organized in late 1946. And this organization will serve as the uh, basis for the Progressive Party, which will emerge in 1948. Uh, people connected with that were uh, hoping to uh, create a new movement which would continue the Roosevelt or New Deal tradition. Well, the Wallace candidacy has started off with uh, some estimate, uh, optimistic estimates of its potential strength, but it found it had a very rough time in 48. The CIO uh, ended up in the Democratic camp. There were a few of the, the left unions which refused to go along with that. And the National Farmers Union, which uh, had exhibited a, a quite a bit of opposition to Truman policies, uh, also did not bolt. The liberal publications like the New Republic and the Nation magazine uh, didn't go with Henry Wallace. Well, as that campaign w uh, went on, uh, support for Wallace uh, dwindled. And after the uh, Truman victory, we find uh, anti-communist liberals uh, claiming that it was uh, their victory. When the Korean War came along, uh, liberals uh, lined up with the administration in uh, support of the war effort and ended up going along with uh, much of the anti-communist legislation. In fact, in some cases, uh, actually sponsoring anti-communist legislation. Uh, someone said, uh, I believe, something like this, that uh, if there was a, a bill proposed to uh, sterilize a communist, uh, these liberals would uh, make sure there were uh, important provisions uh, for the right of appeal. <laughs> Much of the uh, liberal opposition to uh, McCarthyism uh, seems to be based uh, on the idea that the, uh, the anti-communist net thrown out uh, was so broad that it included a lot of liberals, and uh, that seems to be a basis of uh, a good bit of their opposition. That by the late 40s, and certainly by the time of the Korean War, an anti-communist uh, consensus uh, pervaded uh, liberal circles in this country. And those people who didn't share in that consensus uh, were ostracized and often pushed out. Uh, we have uh, some examples of this in the CIO, which 1949, uh, 1950 uh, purged uh, some of the left unions, uh, such as UE and uh, FE. But I'd like to uh, spend a little time looking at the example of liberal agriculture during the Truman era. And we talk about liberal agriculture in the Truman era, we're really only talking about one national organization. National Farmers Union. We're going to talk about uh, a liberal farm organization in the Truman era. That's the National Farmers Union. There's really nothing else. Now, the NFU often has been viewed as the 20th century uh, descendant uh, of the populace. And it supported the uh, family farm, uh, backed the Roosevelt uh, farm program, including strong support for the Farm Security Administration. In the realm of uh, foreign policy, we find the NFU very supportive of the Big Three alliance uh, during the war, uh, in favor of the total defeat of fascism and the creation of the United Nations after the war. Uh, Jim Patton, president of the Farmers Union from 1940 on, had a very good relationship with uh, prominent CIO leaders. And he was an acknowledged spokesman for the uh, left liberal forces 
at the, uh, at the end of World War II. Well, that organization that he headed up became very disgruntled with uh, Truman policies uh, following the war. We find uh, Patton and the NFU uh, calling for the resignation of uh, Clinton Anderson, the Secretary of Agriculture, not once, but uh, uh, several times. So when uh, Truman uh, had a proposal to draft railroad strikers, we find Jim Patton uh, attacking that proposal as, quote, naked, open fascism. 1946, the National uh, Farmers Union reduced its staff in Washington to one person. And after a blast at both Truman and Congress, uh, we find Patton saying, the Farmers Union has lost confidence in the administration's doing anything about legislation we consider important. 1946, 1947, uh, we find uh, Jim Patton talking to uh, people who were interested in a uh, third party. Uh, like many other people, uh, Jim Patton saw Wallace, you know, Henry Wallace, as the heir to the Roosevelt tradition and as the person of, of most appropriate to pick up the New Deal mantle. The National Farmers Union had been opposed to uh, Truman's belligerent stance toward the Soviet Union, was very critical of the proposal for uh, military and economic aid to Greece and Turkey. And Patton lined up with uh, the senators like Claude Pepper and Glenn Taylor as critics of the Truman Doctrine. Now, I don't want to suggest that the National Farmers Union had a complete break with the Truman administration, uh, but relations certainly uh, were strained in this era. And for some people, the Farmers Union looked like a potential recruiting ground uh, for a new third party in 1946, uh, 47, and 48. But when the Wallace movement actually got underway, it proved difficult to convert much of that dissatisfaction with Truman into uh, third party uh, support. There were very few prominent farmer union people who were willing to publicly support the Wallace uh, third party candidacy. Uh, the Iowa Farmers Union President Fred Stover is one of the few 